Okay. So today we're very happy to have uh, Felix Hall from the Institute for Advanced Study um, giving a talk on comments on replica symmetry breaking and gravity. Thanks so much for accepting the invitation and please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so yeah, I, I was a bit torn apart what to talk about and I, I decided to tell you about some work in progress um, with uh, Tarek Anus, who's at Amsterdam. Uh, the, so the, the upside is I'm, I'm excited about this project at the moment and I, I think there might be a nice story to tell. But uh, of course it's all, this is kind of in progress and there will be points in the talk where I'll just uh, you know, <laughs> tell you what would be nice to do, but we haven't done it yet. Uh, but I hope that's okay and maybe more interesting than telling you about finished work and maybe you guys have interesting feedback or suggestions uh, for certain points and how how certain things should work all right so the the outline of my talk you can you can see here I'll, I'll first remind you of a few basic aspects of the SYK model that will be relevant and then I'll tell you about a different model it's called a quantum spherical p-spin model in the literature which is uh, at first sight, very similar to the SYK model, but we'll see uh, in what sense it's it's also quite different, and, and why why that is interesting. Um, so, in particular, I'll focus on on replica symmetry breaking, which I'll, I'll explain what that is and uh, how that happens in this quantum spherical p-spin model, and how it does not happen in the SYK model. Um, then I'll I'll tell you a little bit about dynamics in this model and correlation functions. And in the end, I'll, I'll give some, some comments about a possible gravity picture. Okay. Um, okay, so let me start with the SYK model, which is, uh, you know, for many of us in, in, in this field, uh, the favorite model of disordered quantum mechanics in the last couple of years. Um, I, I wrote here the definition of this model again. So it, it's, a, it's a model of Majorana fermions, psi i, and you have n of them, and you couple them with these uh, interactions j, which are randomly drawn from some, from some Gaussian ensemble uh, with some zero mean and, and this variance that depends on j squared and n. So there's some parameter j squared that characterizes this ensemble, and then there's, of course, n, the number of fermions. Um, the, the reason people are excited about this model is because it's solvable at large n in terms of some master fields that are useful to, to keep in mind. So people refer to these as the g sigma variables where g is some uh, bilocal of these Majorana fermions as, as in this equation, which becomes essentially a classical variable. Um, in, in this large n limit. And then, and then there's this function sigma, which is just a g cube, or, or more generally, we will later have the case where these, uh, these couplings j have more than four indices, which just means that some, some arbitrary number of, uh, of these fermions interact at the same time. That's the, uh, the parameter q that I just mentioned before the talk. That would be the, the number of indices on these random couplings. Um, and then to leading order, if you want to solve this model, then you just have some classical ODE basically for, for these two point functions. Then also what's interesting and important about this model is that at large n, it displays various signatures of uh, black hole physics and therefore serves as a, as a toy model of holography that is, that is solvable, but, but still chaotic. And in fact, it, it's to leading order in, the, in these couplings, it's maximally chaotic. And then there are these corrections that I also just mentioned before. Um, there's a finite entropy density as you approach zero temperature and so on. So, so various features that are consistent with a description in terms of an extremal black hole. The, um, the, the crucial underlying reason for, for these similarities with black hole physics 
uh, are to some extent tied to the emergence of some of a, of a soft mode at large n and uh, in this low energy regime. So when when beta times this j is large, you have an uh, the, there's an uh, an emergent conformal invariance, which is a feature that we'll discuss in some more detail later in this other model. But in in SYK, this this conformal invariance is spontaneously and explicitly broken, where the, the explicit breaking can be described in terms of, a, of the Schwarzian action. You've probably heard about this is what's in action for the for the time reparameterization soft mode associated with this conformal symmetry breaking and the same schwartz in action also occurs or, or comes up as the description of jt gravity in, in two dimensional ideas now of course a, a complete holographic understanding of this syk model is still missing but many many of the features at low energies are described by this jt gravity theory and because of these features, SYK has become an important toy model for holography, but also for studying questions about strongly coupled, coupled quantum systems. Um, so there's of course a lot of literature by now about various questions in, about strongly interacting systems that one can address in this, uh, in this SYK model. Now, when you, when you look at these, these various other models in the literature, you realize that uh, that many of these models so th there's, there's a whole zoo of models with random disorder just like in the syk model and you'll realize that many of them have have a spin glass phase at low temperatures um so what is a spin glass phase it means so here's a more technical definition that i'll make more precise later that there's some condensation of replica of diagonal modes um so so what this means is it, as you as you cool down the system, the system dynamically slows down over a large range of orders of magnitude. So it becomes very viscous and relaxation times become very large. And correlation functions in the system essentially freeze in. Um, so another another way to think about this frustration is that uh, because because the couplings, yeah, so I, I draw some some schematic cartoon here which is supposed to indicate that you have, you have all these random couplings, say between four, four of these uh, spins. And be, because they are random and you have them, and they're all to all couplings, they so have couplings between all possible combinations of four particles. Uh, all, all these interactions try to minimize their energy, but because they're random, they cannot all minimize their energy. Uh, so, so you essentially end up with some random potential and say uh, as these four spins perhaps ma manage to somehow minimize their energy, then, then in this four point interaction, the, it's not possible anymore. And the system, the, the system becomes frustrated. Um, the, the way this manifests is that you have an exponential number of uh, local minima in the, in the energy spectrum. And, and the system just freezes in some random orientation uh, somewhere in this landscape of very ragged uh, free energy. Um, when the system gets stuck somewhere in some energy valley, uh, and there's a large number of other energy valleys, but the system gets stuck somewhere. Sorry, question? And, yes. The large number, exponentially large number of low energy states is exponential in what parameter? Uh, well, n. Or, yeah. Okay, thank you. The size of the system. Um, so sorry. Okay, so, always, these are always some sort of large n. This is always some sort of large n behavior. There's some model that has. Um, it cannot be seen at finite n. I mean. It, um, at finite end, it's certainly going to be hard to study these things. Uh, we'll, we'll see in a minute um, how you, so what I described so far sounds very complicated, right? This, this doesn't sound like something you can analytically study or something, but as we'll see there, there's techniques to do that, but these, these rely on 
on large M. Yeah. So uh, certain, you know, we're going to apply certain type of mean field methods essentially to, to make some progress on this on this difficult question. Uh, and the point would be to identify some slightly more coarse grained order parameter, which which characterizes important aspects of this state of matter. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I wrote here an, another characteristic about energy levels. So, uh, uh, another way to think about this, that, that in this spin glass phase, the, the system loses ergodicity. So the, the, the accessible energy states become uncorrelated and therefore the predictions that you might have from random matrix theory are going to fail. But yeah, but, but of all these things that I mentioned, I, I think what you should keep in mind is that there's this, there's this complicated energy landscape and the system gets stuck somewhere because it just can't satisfy all the constraints that it would like to satisfy in order to minimize energy. So there's just a, a large number of local minima. And, and, and something, something more specific that we'll see later is that uh, correlation functions don't decay, so they, they also freeze in as a, as a, as a reflection of the, of the fact that the system dynamics freezes. All right, so, so we don't have a, or I, I don't think there's a very general understanding for the conditions under what a disordered system has such a spin glass phase. It's to some, it's still a very hard problem. Um, but but it's, it's kind of generic and many systems do have this feature. As you cool them down, this, this frustration uh, kicks in. And then it's kind of surprising uh, that the SYK model actually does not have such a phase. Okay, so, so I, um, I have some recent work here, written down here, where, where people analyzed this question and they, in, in SYK and they concluded that there is no spin glass phase. Um, so, so for instance, in this, in this first paper, what they did is they, they essentially uh, looked at these features that I just mentioned. They computed an effective potential for replica of diagonal modes, whatever that means, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, but, but they were looking for instabilities of the, of, of the, of the paramagnetic phase, of the, of the non-replica symmetry breaking, not non-spin glass phase. And they didn't find any instability in that direction. And they also looked at energy level statistics and, and found that everything is consistent with random matrix theory. So, at first sight, it, it seems like good news for SYK because uh, it sort of indicates that the dual black hole description might be valid for, for large ranges of, for, for very low temperatures. But in, in the spirit of really understanding the, the, the essentials of disorder averaging, that many questions also in quantum gravity have been about recently, uh, we, should, we should try to understand this this uh, sort of generic spin glass behavior a bit better, so it would be good to have a it would be good to have a model that's maybe kind of like SYK, um, but which ha which has this spin glass behavior, so we, we can study this and perhaps study it holographically. Um, so I'm going to tell you about such a model now that we've been uh, looking at. This, uh, this model is not new, so yeah, this has been studied before. The classical version has been studied like almost 30 years ago. But um, I think in light of everything we've learned about SYK in recent years, there's, there's probably interesting new things we can uh, learn by, by asking certain gravity related questions about this model and, and perhaps I have some holographic picture of what's going on. So, Okay, so let me tell you what this, this quantum spherical p-spin model is. So here the, the definition of the model looks somewhat similar to the, to the SYK model. The, 
the main differences are that we now have bosonic spins. So I've replaced these, what, what used to be Majorana fermions by some bosonic uh, vectors, sigma i. Therefore, the, the kinetic term here is a, has two derivatives. Um, the couplings are still like in SYK. So we have random uh, P point interactions. So I'm not setting P to four now, but I, I allow that to be arbitrary. Um, and again, these, these random couplings are drawn from some, some Gaussian ensemble, like here. And then one important difference to the SYK model is that we have to introduce a, this, this constraint here, it basically says the, that these, these uh, bosonic spins have to lie on a sphere of size n. Okay, so this is a constraint enforced by some Lagrange multiplier z. I'll refer to that as the spherical constraint. And this is just engineered such that the, the potential doesn't have runaways in unstable directions, which could happen because we have bosons now. Okay, so the, the, like the magnitude of these spins is always fixed, so, so they, they can't run away. Um, so we'll have to deal with the fact that there's one extra field, which is this Lagrange multiplier implementing that constraint. But other than that, it looks pretty similar to the SYK model. Um, one, one other important fact is that there's two couplings here. In SYK, the only dimensionless coupling was beta j. Uh, in this model, we have beta j and we have m over beta, which is like a dimensionless temperature where m m was this parameter here in front of the kinetic term. Okay, so that, that's the model I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, study. Now, what we wanna compute in that model, but before we can compute anything, we would like to have uh, some effective description for which we need to compute the, the, free, the free energy. And the free energy has to be computed in the presence of this disorder averaging. Sorry, so one quick question. Uh, the okay. M could not be absorbed in redefinition of sigmas. What could be reabsorbed? M, M. I mean, it's just a uh, kinetic term, right? Yeah, so in, in SYK, that's what you could do, which is why there's no second parameter. But here you cannot because this spherical constraint already fixes the normalization of sigma. Oh, I see, thanks. Yeah. So, it's not, so you could you could have alternatively said that that's the parameter that decides the size of that sphere, the radius of the sphere. Yeah, you can think about it that way. Yeah. Good. So, so now we're going to compute the, the free energy, so log z, but we need to compute log z uh, in the disorder average theory. And it's, so, so here, we need to, we want to compute log z, which is a function of the couplings, and then this order average the whole thing. That's what this, uh, this over line means. It means that the path, that the integral over the disorder with this Gaussian weighting. Um, and it's, a, it's an important point that we first have to comp compute log z for any given coupling, and then this order average. So the, that's what's called a uh, quench disorder. That means the, the random variables, the j's, they're frozen or quenched and they don't take part in the dynamics. So this is opposed to annealed disorder where j would be allowed to fluctuate and be part of the path integral. Um, so you, you, you might think the or this doesn't matter whether you do the path integral first over j, but uh, but the, the point of this whole discussion, of course, is that it does matter. Um, so, yeah, here, here's, here's the associated equation. So we have we have log z for any realization of the random coupling, and then we do the the disorder average over that quantity. And of of course, our favorite way to do that is using the replica trick, uh, because we cannot compute log z directly we instead write log z as the limit as n goes to zero of the nth derivative of z to the n. Right, so that's, uh, I, know, I think 
some, some people in the audience are probably more familiar with the replica trick in the context of entanglement entropy. Uh, this is this is morally a very similar. Um, well, I guess the main difference being that we take n to zero in the end, and that the the sheets, you know, if you're used to thinking about sheets being glued together in, in entanglement entropy computations, of course we're not doing that here, but we're just having uh, separate instances of z, and we need to compute z to the n and this order average that. Um, as usual, we're going to assume that n is an integer first and then do an analytic continuation later. Uh, so we start by defining some bilinear field, just like in the SYK model, which is a bilinear. So this is like the G variable in the SYK model that we had before, which is a bilinear of these spin variables. Um, and e each of them have now a replica index. So we're introducing this bilinear now on the replica manifold. So I drew some, yeah, I drew some picture here, which isn't supposed to mean much. It's just <laughs> to have some sort of illustration uh, in case you're used to thinking about the replica trick being copies of the system that you correlate somehow, then this bilocal variable now describes correlations between uh, different copies of the system. And so, so, so that's, that's the, the, the obvious thing to do. But now if we want to make any progress, we need to make an ansatz for, for what this cross replica bilinear field should look like. And so the, it turns out that there's a, that there's a very good, uh, a very educated guess for what this ansatz should be. Um, so first of all, the, the naive thing you can do is assume a replica symmetric ansatz, where these bilinears are just proportional to a delta function in replica space and multiply some function of the time. If you do that, uh, th then you're ending up with an analysis that's exactly like an SYK, basically, um, where, you, where, you have, where you don't have to worry about the fact that there might be cross replica correlations. And you just treat all the replicas as independent and that, that gives you the right answer for SYK. Um, but it doesn't have to give you the right answer, and in this case, it doesn't. So, so what people do is uh, something called a one-step replica symmetry breaking ansatz, it's RSB here, where we think of Q as a matrix in replica space that we divide up into blocks. So it's an N by N matrix for N replicas, and we divide it into identical blocks. Each, blocks uh, each block is m by m. So it's some divisor of n. And we make this particular ansatz for these blocks. So we say that these blocks have a, have a diagonal, consists of identical functions q of, the, of time. And then we have these off diagonal parameters, which are going to be identical constants that are uh, measures of correlations between replicas. So, okay, so what, why does this make sense? The, I think the intuition is just that um, we're dividing phase space in some sensible way, where the idea is that at low temperatures, you have uh, uh, multiple ground states are possible. And now we're assuming that these M, M replicas are weakly coupled and so, sorry, the M replicas, so the, so the, not the replicas that represent this, this block. We assume they are sort of weakly coupled and all end up in the same ground state, some, somewhere in this landscape. And all the other replicas uh, are then extremely likely to sit in some other ground state. Okay, so that's the idea that these guys sit in some ground state and then the next block sits in some other ground state. Um, but on top of that, we have to assume that all the ground states are sort of equivalent due to the randomness of the, uh, of, of the potential. And therefore, um, yeah, because all these states are, are equivalent, the, the, the self overlaps, these parameters u, it makes sense that they should all be the same. 
Yeah. When you say coupled, you mean correlated, right? Yeah, yeah. So when, when you say, how, how should we think about the cross replica correlators, correlations physically? I have a system that has a large number of low energy states, so that I understand. There's some sort of a, a quenched averaging uh, disorder that I understand as well. But what's the physical meaning of, is there, is there some sort of observable I can calculate to detect these or? Yeah, so the, the so, so really this U here is sort of the order parameter for this, for, for this process. Um, when, which is, well, well, we'll see later the role that this U is going to play in correlation functions, which is what you're asking about. Um, yeah, if I, if I write the U more explicitly, what U is, right? U is the off diagonal term in this replica block, Q tilde. So it's the, it's this two point function of the sigmas essentially, where, where there are two averages going on. So, so you first take a thermodynamic average, which is these angle brackets, and then you do a disorder average over that whole thing. Um, Thanks so much. Yeah, does that make sense? So, good. So, um, so the, the thermodynamic average factorizes Okay, so before we do the disorder average, we just get a product of these two uh, one point functions, which of course should be constant and independent of i because of translation invariance. Um, but what exact value this, this, these one point functions take is to some extent random because the couplings j were random. So there's lots of different approximate minima. The, the point of this uh, the, the physical point of this replica symmetry breaking is that even even after you do the average over the couplings, uh, this parameter u is still non-zero. So you still get some you still get some non-zero order parameter for this symmetry breaking, for the spontaneous breaking of this uh, replica symmetry. Okay. And there's another there's another thing to answer Nima's question uh, mm -hmm. is that. Uh, in the disorder average theory, there are actually interactions between these Q matrices that appear, even though you wouldn't imagine such a thing happening. Doing the disorder average in the replicated theory introduces these couplings. Now, of course, you could think that that's spurious, but it ends up having an effect even in the n to zero limit. I see. You're saying that there's an effective interaction induced by that disorder averaging. Mm -hmm. So they are actually coupled in that sense. I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Um, so, okay, here's another uh, picture sort of trying to indicate the same thing. Now, um, yeah, okay. I, I, I simplified a little bit in, de in describing this ansatz. So you can, you can also ask, uh, well, why should the off diagonal terms here, why should they be non-zero? And shouldn't I perhaps be considering more general ansatz? Uh, there, in, indeed, there are more general ansatz, uh, more, more general ansatz of, for a higher step replica symmetry breaking where you replace the Qs here by their own one RSB matrix. So, so there's more general things you can do. So I'm not trying to describe in detail, just to keep in mind, but it turns out that in, in this model, they're not relevant. So that there's always a consistent way to, to come back to this ansatz and this is actually the most general thing you need to consider in this particular model. Um, good, so, so let's look at the, the equations, the saddle point equations here. Um, it's convenient, so, so we want saddle point equations essentially for this matrix. 
right? These are our, these are our fields now, it's in particular Q, and also, uh, also this constant U, and even the size of these blocks M are all gonna be parameters that we have to determine dynamically, sort of. So there's going to be equations determining these parameters uh, in an optimal way. Um, and of course, even though we're in the full replica space, the equations of motion are gonna be quite simple now, I mean, relatively simple due to this ansatz because, uh, because we have enormously reduced the number of fields. So even though we allow for replica symmetry breaking, essentially we have the field Q, and then we have some parameters U and M, and, and this Lagrange multiplier that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, so you can write down equations for these uh, parameters. Um, I wrote them here, though, the, the ones that I wrote faintly, you should probably just uh, ignore. <laughs> but, but perhaps look at the, uh, perhaps look at the first equation. That's sort of the equation that tells you how, how the variable Q is determined in, here in Fourier space where K is momentum. And what I have done here is I've, I've redefined Q slightly. Uh, so I've subtracted from Q this order parameter U. The idea being that either, either, either the system is in a replica symmetric phase, then U is zero anyway, or if it's not, then this U is expected to be the the value that two point functions decay to. And that's what I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this feature of spin glasses that you have uh, uh, two point functions freezing into some value, which is going to be U. So, okay, so there's an equation here in frequency space that determines this function QR. And if you're familiar with the SYK model, this, this, this equation should also look somewhat familiar. Uh, essentially the difference in the SYK model is just that you have a single, you have a single power of K here because of the, the kinetic term for fermions as opposed to a kinetic term for bosons. And then you also have this self energy type term on the right hand side that is the Fourier transform of Q to the power P minus one again subtracted this uh, plateau value that we, that we expect the two-point function to decay to. And then there's some further equations which determine the other parameters that I mentioned, the Lagrange multiplier, uh, and in particular, the parameters U and M determining the structure of the replica symmetric, symmetry breaking uh, ansatz. Now, uh, even just from looking at these equations very quickly, you see that you can solve them by setting u to zero and m to one. But, but it turns out that uh, below some transition temperature, this is not the right solution to look at in, in the sense that it doesn't minimize the free energy or yeah, maximize the free energy. It's a curiosity of the replica trick, but uh, it doesn't matter. You have, you have to extremize the free energy as usual and uh, below some transition temperature, this is not the right uh, answer anymore. And I think, uh, I think this is wrong. I think it should be the other way around. Uh, like this. Um, and uh, the correct solution that extremizes the free energy is going to be one where U and M take values other than zero and one. Um, it's kind of important for this to analytically continue the equations of motion for M and for U. So if we only allow M to be an integer uh, in solving these equations, then we would miss the phase transition because the, the correct solution has some value of M that lies between zero and one. Uh, so you can see this in this in, in this plot here, that as a function of beta j, you reach some critical value where, where u and m start to differ from, from their values zero and one in the, in the high temperature system. And u, u jumps to some value and then asymptotically approaches one. Uh, 
Right. So. So in the case of uh, running running analytic continuation of running entropy to get entanglement entropy, we what we do is that we take trace of row two power of n and imagine n belongs to a complex plane. That's a fully well defined object because this, there's some sort of a sum over eigenvalues of the density matrix taken to some power. Here is what is the interpretation of this analytic continuation in M? Well, it's 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 quite similar, but. Um, so, so remember we had two parameters, n and m, where n was the power that we took z to. So that's kind of like the, the parameter you're talking about in, in Rennie entropies. But then on top of that, we had m, which, which describes the structure of this one RSB ansatz, which describes the block size in this matrix. And, and that is really a parameter that it has to be determined by its own equation of motion. So the, the very first one, n, I, I understand that there is a similarity between that and the Rennie n, right? But then the second one, m, that confuses me. What, what confuses you? At the m, analytically continuing m. So uh, my understanding, roughly speaking, is that that uh, changing the value of n does that correspond actually does that correspond to sort of changing the probability distribution that we started with or no the no the, the probability distribution is fixed uh, the, this m corresponds to to looking for the right you know tuning this ansatz and and looking for the right for the right values such that this ansatz uh, extremizes the free energy. But the way, in, in the way that Felix wrote this, you'd see that n, m has to divide n. Yeah, you're breaking n up into n by n blocks, or n by n matrix into n by n blocks. And so in the analytic continuation of n, you also implicitly have to analytically continue m to the complex plane as well. So are you, are you saying that what, what you're actually analytically continuing is only one parameter? M over yeah. M is always kept to be an integer or a positive integer? No, no, no. No, no. no. So you're, you're, you're analytically continuing the size of the matrix to be a complex plane. And M defines a sub-block in a matrix whose size is now a complex number. So M can also be a complex number. Uh, I understand. I understand that. What, what I'm just saying is that this analytic continuation is a little bit of a, has a different nature from entanglement to be analytic continuation because over there, there is a way to interpret analytically analytic, you know, complex values of n as something that we perfectly understand. There is some sort of physical picture of what we are calculating. Here, I'm not quite sure if there's a physical picture for if I take m to be two plus i, if there's a physical picture for that. Yeah, here, I, I think, yeah, there's no nice physical picture. Nevertheless, there, th this is like the subject of some very com complicated analysis work that mathematicians have uh, studied, and they show that it is, uh, is legal. I don't know if there's a nice physical picture, though. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so, okay, so here's a here's phase transition and then M takes some value between zero and one because of this confusion. Now, uh, um, what other features? So, so if you try to solve these equations, there's, there's various regimes in which you can solve them analytically or perturbatively. Um, I'm not going to go through all of that, but one, one that might be of particular interest because of the similarity with SYK is that there's a, there's a regime where the equations are solved by, by a conformal uh, scaling uh, two-point function. So, so this, this main equation of motion here, if you look at it in the regime of low energies, which I specified here, then this, this function qr in, in time space can, uh, is, 
is, a, is a approximately given by, by a conformal answer. Uh, importantly, uh, importantly note that this is an equation for QR and recall that the uh, Q, QR was the original Q that shows up in the replica symmetry breaking ansatz minus this constant value U. So, so this means in case U is non-zero, then the actual, the actual two-point function Q is actually this conformal piece plus a constant. Now, what's also interesting is that in the, so in, in the replica symmetric phase, when U is zero, then the analysis is like in SYK and you get the same answer as in SYK, namely that this thing should, have, should scale uh, with a scaling dimension one over P, where P was the number of indices on the, on the coupling. Uh, um, but in the in this spin glass phase at low temperatures, when U takes some finite value, then this anomalous dimension is actually one. So so that's a that's an interesting new feature. So we have some uh, that doesn't happen in SYK. Then we have some marginal operator uh, de describing the system in in this regime. In this uh, sorry, one question: the the capital N, the number of bosons you took to infinity already, or you are doing finite N? Um, I'm I'm doing a large N. That is a large N saddle point equations. Oh, okay, thank you. So, um, sorry, another question. So this QR is a is a two point function for a marginal operator. You're saying what was that? What is that operator? I mean the. The, I mean, formally, the operator was this thing as I defined it in the beginning. That Q was uh, Q was this bilocal guy. Uh, where did it go? Well, the, the, here, this thing. Um, I see, but it's not like I see. I see. So it's a sum over these guys, and then the this the expectation value of this guy is becoming something that looks like the two-point function of some marginal operator. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so that's something we, we would like to understand better what that means. It indicates that there's some, some modulized space configurations. You can describe it as operator. Okay. Um, yeah, now no, let me, Okay, maybe this becomes a bit more concrete if I, if I tell you about correlation functions. Um, so th this is what I advertised in the beginning that, and what we can explicitly see in this model, if we compute a two-point function, um, it doesn't decay to zero in the spin glass phase. So these are, this, this plot here is uh, a numerical solution of, the, of these equations that I showed you uh, for two cases. Uh, one one case being some some coupling J that corresponds to the to the replica symmetric case, and one case uh, where I picked a coupling that corresponds to the to the replica symmetry breaking spin glass phase, and you can see that in this spin glass case, the two point function plateaus <clears throat> and reaches some value, which is precisely this U. Uh, more precisely, what I plotted here is a is a two point, is a Whiteman function. Um, well, the, yeah, you can think of that as the, symmet the symmetric function, the, the commutator of this boson spin. Uh, good. Here's another another solution that you can get analytically that I did not tell you about. It's in a different regime, which is in the regime when the coupling is very small. So currently, yeah, as I said at the beginning, this is, this is work in progress. What we're trying to do at the moment is computing, uh, using these results for two-point functions to compute real-time four-point functions. Because these would be, these would really be relevant to gravity, especially out of time order correlation functions. If we can cal calculate them, they might give us some, some interesting idea about uh, what, ha what should happen in a gravitational picture. So I, th I think what you would expect is that 
in the spin yaws phase, you certainly won't see sub, uh, you won't see maximal chaos for sure. But I don't know, perhaps a loss of chaoticity uh, altogether. Um, I'll, uh, I think I'll say a little bit more about it down uh, down below. So yeah, the, the idea being that if you have an ergodic system, then the system in equilibrium visits all, all kind of equilibrium states at the same energy. But in this spin glass phase, the system gets trapped somewhere in some, in some local minimum of, the, of this energy landscape. So it, it can only explore other minima uh, very slowly, if at all. So you would expect qualitatively that this behavior influences all out of time order correlation functions, for example. I would like to would like to see how that how that works in detail. Um, it's in principle it's clear what you have to do. So you can you can try to do an analysis like in the SYK model, where in order to compute a four point function, you expand this this action around the saddle point. <clears throat> right, this this Q field, which is the two point function, you expand it around some saddle point Q star. Then you have some fluctuation field and a quadratic action, you obtain a quadratic action for the fluctuation field. And the four point function is essentially just the inverse of whatever you have in that quadratic action. Now you can, uh, can explicitly work out what this quadratic action looks like. And it, again, there's some expressions here that if you're not familiar with SYK, you probably want to ignore that. But for the experts, this, this looks, um, this, this looks very similar to SYK in the sense that in, in the replica symmetric case, when I send M to zero here, then this L inverse term in the, in the inverse four point function vanishes. And I'm just left with K, which is exactly like the ladder kernel in SYK if I set U to zero here. But then, Clearly, if U is not zero, if we're in this in this uh, frozen spin glass phase, then some something interesting new is going to happen, and we have to we have to invert this Q operator um, for finite values of U and M. Right. So, so in SYK, what this kernel is this describes is simply the if you have a four point function, you can construct it as a disconnected piece, and then you can exchange any number of these melon graphs to get the leading, uh, to, to, get a, to get the answer for the four point function. All right, so that's as, as far as I'll tell you about this uh, model for now. Now, I have a few, a few comments about, about gravity. I should say I'm, I'm, I'm not sold on any of this. These are really just comments. Uh, sorry, can I ask before we change the subject? Now, in the sig nonlinear sigma model, usually you can also put a source for the sigma, like J A sigma A, to compute correlation functions of the sigma A after the large end limit. Can you do something like that here? Yeah, you can. You can do that, and in fact, I think that's what people have have done before. Um, I mean, the sigma yeah. model is a free theory because you don't have the J i one i n. So, but here you can still do it, I guess. Or... Yeah, you can you can do that. Uh... Okay. Yeah. 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 It's it's not something we've uh, we've tried to do so far. Mm. Uh... Yeah, this will be something to look at. Um, okay, so so a few comments about gravity, which are which are really just comments because I, I don't think we don't have a good understanding of this at this point. And maybe you guys have comments. Um, so okay, let me let me be a little bit naive first and and just say that at first sight, computing z to the n disorder averaged in 2D gravity is something that we've learned a lot about in recent years. This, this paradigm has, uh, 
emerged where semi-classical gravity might actually describe an ensemble average of quantum systems. And in order to account for disorder averaging and gravity, one should include space-time wormhole geometries and things like that. And then you get sensible answers. So by, by computing these kind of uh, wormhole geometries and JT gravity, these guys got sensible answers for very subtle questions about uh, things like this uh, average values of late time spectral form factors or the page curve in related contexts. Now you might think, well, if we can compute these things, then you know we can go and try to compute log z at this order average and, and try to come up with a gravity picture. And uh, this, this is sort of what's what was done recently in this paper, where they had some advocated some some sort of picture like this, where the disorder average of z to the n would correspond to, you know, you know these u's here were indicating my uh, the the overlap between different off diagonal between different replicas, uh, and now you sort of model these with wormhole geometries, but. So it's not, I'm not sure if this is exactly the same spirit as this one replica symmetry breaking ansatz that I described. But first of all, these wormholes are not on shell, but, but more, um, more about the equations. We did, not, we did not really solve the equations for, for integer values of m and n, then analytically continued, but m had its own equation of motion. So, there was some sort of dynamics to that, some, some equations that set m to some, some value between zero and one. Um, and then also importantly, there was this order parameter u that played an important role in this replica symmetry breaking as I described it. And indeed what they, what they found in that paper was that this is not, this is sort of reminiscent of spin glass phenomenology, but it's not quite the same. And it has some certain different features that are different, which I can tell you about. Um, but, it, but it seems like we need something slightly different to have, a, to have an appropriate gravity picture, um, where we have really some gravitational analog of this one replica symmetry break, one step replica symmetry breaking ansatz that I described. Um, now there's there's been there's been work of course previously by uh, by by Tarek and his collaborators for example on uh, on on proposals for glassy model glassy uh, holographic models of glassy physics these are slightly different types of glasses um, but it's a suggestive picture where they uh, where they investigate certain multi-centered fragmented black brain solutions, the stable bound states of, of black holes that are held in place by various uh, gravitational and electromagnetic forces. And they have certain glassy features in the sense that there's a, there's a large landscape of, uh, of bound states um, if, if these stable configurations of multi black brain solutions exist and there, they tend, there tend to be many of them um, and they also show these features of slow relaxation and so on. Um, but, but I think that in, so, so these models are a little bit compli more complicated in, this, in higher dimensions. Um, and in, in this context of this spherical peace plane model that I told you about, it seems that maybe there's, a, there's an opportunity to have, a, to have a much simpler, like, a very simple picture that involves ADS2 physics, where we can perhaps understand some gravitational analog of this replica symmetry breaking mechanism. Um, yeah, and then so, something I, I, I recently learned about is that there's this, that there's indeed a very simple picture of how, how you can have these multi, multi black hole solutions in some sense in ADS2. Uh, that, that was explored a long time ago and goes on the name of ADS2 fragmentation, where, where in this paper they studied the near horizon geometry of uh, 4D extremal Reissner-Nordstrom black holes. 
with fixed charge Q. And, and their near horizon region is described by some very simple geometry uh, here that, that's characterized. So the geometry and, uh, and the field strength are characterized by some, some potential, some, some, some dipole-like potential. So, sorry, I should say. So, so, so what they do, you can do for multiple black holes, right? So not some black holes, and then analyze the near horizon region. Uh, I'm drawing here the case for two, two black holes where you have uh, the near horizon region that splits up into two regions with charges Q1 and Q2. Uh, and you have some dipole potential that describes the geometry for that. Now, as you go far away from, from these regions, at large S, X, this potential just looks like a uh, potential for a single charge. <clears throat> but but uh, uh, as, you, as you go in, this ADS2 throat splits into two, two separate throats. So the, the replica symmetry breaking order parameter maybe has some, some uh, place in this story because it, it knows about the microstates to some extent. In some, in some slightly coarse-grained way, and its non-zero value indicates that there's some complicated energy landscape. Um, so, so perhaps this this fragmentation of ADS2 throats could be the gravitational mechanism that's uh, that's sort of analogous to this replica symmetry breaking, the way I described it. Um, the where the, the parameters characterizing the solution would then be variational parameters that you can tune in this geometry to try and uh, extremize the free energy. Okay, so these are some just some ideas. Uh, here's a brief summary of what I told you about. So I told you that even though the, that spin glass physics is quite common in and sort of quite, happens quite generically in these in these various models, but SYK does not have it. So I, inv I investigated a model that somehow looks very similar to SYK, which does have a phase like that. And we're currently looking at signatures of gravity in, in observables such as out of time order correlation functions for their own sake to understand something new about chaos in spin classes, but then also to learn something, some hints about the gravitational description, hopefully. But, um, which is still the, an interesting open question. What is, what is the precise gravitational mechanism that describes describes the physics in this model that I tried to tell you about. Um, okay, uh, I think I'm done. So please, uh, Thank you so much. comments or questions. Are there any questions? Um, I would like to ask a question. Um, actually, perhaps um, yes, so I, I want to understand about the uh, glass phase. Uh, I thought glass phase is characterized by uh, many almost degenerate vacua. So in this case, do we expect to have um, some quasi-classical gravity dual, which is a specific unique geometry, or rather we would expect to have some ensemble of gravity duals and to calculate anything in the bulk we need to average over all of those. And, and those, and each individual gravity dual geometry might have different properties and different webs mirroring what is happening uh, on your um, uh, glass, glass model side. Um, well, of course, I'm not, I'm not sure what's, what's the answer in the end, but, but I, uh, I, I thought the idea was that uh, that, that you have a that you have a gravitational theory, which is a single theory, that describes the that describes the physics of an ensemble averaged quantum system. Um, I mean, a single black hole geometry is supposed to capture many states that, from the perspective of thermodynamics, look very similar. Yeah. And that's the, what the entropy is capturing. Well, you, if the states are very similar, then fine. But uh, in the uh, spin glass case, 
those states may have very similar energy, but they have very different expectation values of certain local operators. So you cannot have, that's why I think you cannot have the same classical gravity dual. Or maybe you can, but uh, I'm just giving you an, uh, I don't understand what are the operators which will have different web, but I want to accommodate for that. So you want, want to average on the gravity side somehow? I, I don't want to, have, uh, well, yeah, I want to average over different classical configurations, quasi-classical configurations on the gravity side. Or, or maybe they're not classical, I don't know, just quantum gravity configurations. Hmm. And I, I, I don't see, maybe I'm missing something, I don't see an argument why there will be unique classical gravity dual for this ensemble. Well, well I think you, it, but, yeah. I was going to say, you know, the, the grab, so for example, in this multi-centered case, yeah. the, uh, each, each solution itself, it has many, okay, so they, they are actually distinguishable by their multiple moments of the electric field. And so they, you know, you, you do indeed have many, so if you look at the gravitational field itself, all of them look the same at large distances, kind of like ADS2 with one total energy, but they all do have, you can, they can wild, be wildly different in very subleading pieces of the electric field. And that might not be very easy to measure, but they will distinguish between the states. Yeah, so, so you have lots of different states, configurations for those gravitational solutions, but it's all, but all in the same theory. <laughs> Yeah, yes, yes. I would think you would have a lot of different configurations within the same theory. I do not know if those configurations will be classical, uh, but perhaps they would. And then you would integrate. I mean, you can imagine a situation when in your gravity path integral, you don't have a saddle point. You have a spin glass structure as well, where you need to sum over many configurations. I, I mean, we probably don't know explicit examples, but Nothing excludes such a scenario. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? So I do have one question. Yeah. My very naive, my lack of knowledge about spin phases. So supposedly we're trying to model some glassy physics uh, that we see in nature. And the models that people have come up with are they always have some sort of large N, is that true? I mean, this is the way we found to model glassy physics or because, yeah. Um. All phase transitions, I think, you need some thermodynamic limit. Yeah, but it's not always large N, right? We have phase transitions in nature that happen at finite N. They happen but in- at large, But at large volume. Large volume, which is more physical. Well, but in, for example, in the Ising model, large N and large volume are the same. <clears throat> I see, you're saying that once you're talking about quantum mechanics, there's not much distinction between the two. Right. Hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Any last question for Felix? Um, yeah, so in in the action for the SYK, you had a constraint term, right? Uh, so is there any gravitational analog for this constraint term? Because usually in the wormhole geometries, the saddle points that dominate is the completely disconnected one or just the completely connected one. So if you have to move away from these trivial ones, is there anything that you have to introduce like a constraint? Um, so in, in SYK, there is no constraint. Right? Yeah. I, I, I think you're talking about this uh, spherical constraint. Yeah, yeah. That we have in this- uh, The quantum spherical. In this space. other model. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Uh, 
yeah, at, at that level of detail, I'm not I'm not sure if there's a if there's a gravity analog of that. I, yeah, I mean, I mean, something relevant to what you just said is the these wormhole geometries and JT gravity, they're exponentially suppressed. So in in that sense, they're kind of they're kind of different because the the phase transition and this and uh, the spin glass model happen, happens at an order one temperature. Now, if you just start including wormholes, you might see effects at an exponentially small temperature, um, which is different. So, so somehow that, that, that j just including those wormholes doesn't seem like uh, it's enough to model what's, what's going on here. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thanks so much, Felix, uh, for the great talk. And thanks everyone who joined. Um, have a great day, and we're going to post this video on YouTube. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Lois. Okay, thanks, Nima. See ya. See ya.